All right, Matthew chapter 23. You know, I really don't, didn't want to break this up. I think it's, uh, the whole chapter is sort of about one thing. So we're going to look at, uh, hopefully, the whole chapter tonight. And uh, so maybe just a lot of reading, and I've got some words to say, too. So uh, at least you'll get much of God's word. That's best anyway. Uh, if I add anything to it, I'll probably mess it up. But Proverbs, uh, Matthew 23, uh, verses 1 through 39, which is the entire chapter. Uh, so by way of introduction, maybe we won't read every verse. That'd be 39 verses, nothing wrong with that, but uh, we'll end up reading any, everything anyway, Lord willing, if everything goes as planned. So Matthew 23, and uh, verses 1 through 39. So let's just read maybe the first few verses or so, and there's some pretty good stuff right at the beginning as well. So then he just leaves uh, where uh, uh, he's speaking to that, you know, the guy trying to trip him up, the, uh, the lawyer, and what's the greatest commandment? And he said, you know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. Uh, and then he said, the second like it to it, like thy, love thy neighbor as thyself. And then, uh, then of course, uh, well, whatever. So that, that's kind of where we came from. And then he gets into uh, kind of a different dissertation. He now then t- turns to, you know, the multitude and the disciples. So kind of finishes answering these questions of two specific people. And the disciples are there and others are there more than likely. But now he kind of just says in verse 1, here then spake, spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore uh, whatsoever they bid you observe, that, uh, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They're hypocrites. They say, but they don't do. They say, do this, do this, and they don't even do it. And they bi- blind, excuse me, verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Very, uh, we'll kind of stop there, but very telling of the Pharisees. And then it goes on through the entire chapter and just, again, speaks out more woes and more issues and problems and, and way they, the way the Pharisees are. Kind of Jesus reveals really who they are in their core. So Matthew 23, uh, here the first few verses. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, would you help us, Lord, as we look into your word? May you guide us in all your thoughts, and may you lead us as we, uh, as we look into your word. May you give us illumination. May the Spirit of God lead us into the truth of God's word. And we all pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here we see the woe to the religious hypocrite. So really what we have now, of course, this a Pharisee arguably is unsaved, non-Christian, not even saved. Later on, he'll even describe that in, uh, in verse... Uh, I think, for, you know, further down. Uh, I think verse 4, verse 5, that kind of thing. I'm sorry, four, 14 and 15. But, you know, woe to religious hypocrites because usually the ones, well, not, not across the board, but in most cases, sometimes the people that cause problems are unsaved people that think they're converted, think they're saved, they're not even. And often those are the wolves in sheep's clothing or the wolves in shepherd's clothing. Uh, sometimes even the pastor can be a wolf in shepherd's clothing. And it's just not a real Christian. It's not genuine, whether they are a result of an easy, believe, or an easy prayerism type of thing to where they made a decision, but it wasn't genuine. It never was real. They never got the real deal. Uh, you know, some of these people, they act and sound saved, but they really are not. And they're hypocrites. But these people, uh, these Pharisees, uh, you know, the scribes even, Jesus is speaking of that. But the overwhelming principle, is if we, if we take through every single verse, every single woe that's given to them, is we must be genuine. We must be genuine. Now, some people in our church are way genuine and to, almost to a fault to where they just tell you what they're thinking, which I appreciate their genuine and upfrontness. But so it's not just so much as being real and genuine and just uh, very uh, uh, frank with people. That's one side of being genuine, but being genuinely sensitive to God, genuinely flexible to letting, letting God mold you and make you into the Christian he needs you to be. Not just being upfront and clear with people, but it goes beyond that and having the attributes of a true Christian. Uh, being one, being one, and then acting like a true Christian. So we must be real. The story is told of a zoo that was noted for their great collection on different animals. One day the gorilla died, and to keep up the appearance of a full range of animals, the zookeeper hired a man to wear a gorilla suit to fill in for that dead animal. It was his first day on the job, and the man didn't know how to act like a gorilla, uh, like a gorilla very well. And as he tried to move uh, in con- convincingly, he got too close to the wall in the, of the enclosure and tripped and fell into the lion exhibit. He began to scream, convinced his life was over, until the lion spoke to him. Be quiet or you're going to get us both fired. So we ought to be real. 
You know, some of us have the, the, the suit of a Christian. We kind of look like one on the outside. But are you really a true believer on the inside? Did you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, not plus anything, no works of your own, but trusting, turning from God in repentance, from God to the Savior, asking God to forgive you of all your sin, asking him to come into your life and save you from your sin, give you a home in heaven, uh, locked from hell for all eternity? Do you have the free gift of eternal life? I mean, I'm really, uh, you know, want us to have that desire, and we ought to see that, we ought to have that desire for others, that they are truly converted, truly saved people. Number one, we ought to be genuine toward Christian works. If you look at verses 1 through 12, it kind of marks the works of a Christian, how Christians or believers should truly act. It starts out in verse 2 as he speaks to the multitude and his disciples as in verse 1 teaches. Then in verse 2 it talks about these people uh, sitting in Moses' seat. Now, we could go into the idea of Moses' seat. I don't want to necessarily go into that, but rather the fact that they sit in places of prominence. You know what I really appreciate, really appreciate about my Bible college is you could sit with professors at lunchtime. It wasn't that you know, the, the presidents and the professors were over here eating kind of separate from the students, but you could eat with the president of the college. You could eat with their, your Bible professors, your Greek teachers. You could eat with all these people. It didn't, it did, there was no dichotomy among religious leaders, but often in false religion, that's the case. Where you can't get to the Pope, you, well, you know, you can't even shake his hand. I mean, you'll have, secret, you'll have uh, his security surround you, and, you know, hey, what are you doing, buddy? You know, he's got, like, his personal security in that, the, what is that, Pope wagon he drives around in. Uh, you know, and, and so many false religions, you can't even get to the pastor. You can't even get to the Pope. I remember I was in this huge, large church where they, uh, where they sort of kind of worship pastors, and they worship uh, you know, uh, Christian leaders, and there's a, there's a degree of respect for a pastor, but I remember the line was so long, you could, not even, you could not even shake this guy's hand. The line was so long. It was like down the aisle of a huge church, like around the, the back of the, the auditorium, and, and you, just, you couldn't even shake the guy's hand. You couldn't even talk to the pastor. It's just crazy. Now, you know, he was really popular, but it's just, it's just interesting sometimes the divide that some religious leaders have with their people, and so that's kind of what we see in verse 2, just they sit in these places of prominence away from the people. Uh, and often they wouldn't even go to people that are, uh, you know, they would even criticize Peter, uh, uh, Jesus to not eating with uh, a publicans and sinners. They wouldn't even go and eat with people that were just lowly or they deemed unworthy. So be genuine toward Christian works. We ought to work for God. Work for the night is coming. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work mid springing flowers. Work when the day grows brighter. Work when the, in the glow, glowing sun. Work for the night is coming. Work when man's, uh, when man's work is done. We had to work. We had to work. You know, verse 3 is uh, they would require all these works. And then in verse 4, they would require all these heavy burdens and grievous things. And they wouldn't even lift a finger in verse 4. That is false religion. Do, do, do. I'm not really going to do it. I'm not going to help you do it. I'm not even going to, I'm going to even be hypocritical. And it, there's a degree of hypocrisy in this. They do, uh, they require you to do, and they do not, Jesus said, which is ultimately who they were in their character. And yet they won't even lift a finger. You know, we ought to sincerely be his disciple. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. When we come to Jesus Christ, and we want to be a disciple, student of Jesus Christ, we come with nothing of our own. We don't come with a pretense to sit in a high seat. We don't come with a pretense to order people around to do, 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 and to do not. And we don't, uh, we don't even uh, come into a position of we won't lift a finger. And some Christians have that mindset. I won't even lift a finger. We forsake all of that and follow God. We serve him. Sincerely follow the Bible. You know, it's interesting in verse 3, if you look at that one more time, uh, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. So Jesus is saying, really what they're saying isn't all, all that bad. They, you know, arguably they're saying some right stuff out of the Bible. For you to obey, you ought to observe my word. So he's not really criticizing what they're saying necessarily, was, but, but, but rather the hypocriticalness of how they position themselves, that they were asking them to observe God's word, yet they were not even willing to observe God's word. And if you remember, they would require so much things for the Sabbath, yet they didn't honor the Sabbath properly, and they would look for loopholes and ways around uh, doing work on the Sabbath. And they would even be against healing on the Sabbath, which God never necessarily intended to be, but they added that to the Sabbath. We ought to sincerely help people in the Christian life. We ought to invest in other people, Galatians 5.14. We ought to offer help where it's needed, Matthew 24.40. Seek wisdom in Proverbs 16.16. 16. Uh, practice hospitality, Hebrews 13.2. Show forgiveness, Mark 11.25. And worship God, not men, in Galatians 5.24.
But now we look at verse 5. Some more things about working for God and uh, doing good works in, in the Christian life. But look at verse 5. We ought to sincerely dress for God. Look at verse 5. But all their works they do for it to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they did that to be seen of men. Now, on the surface, it might be say, well, you know, God told them to have phylacteries, and, uh, which was little boxes that contained uh, parts of the, the, the law, the Mosaic law. And, uh, you know, they were to have that, but they were making it bigger, and they were parading it. And uh, it's almost like writing the Ten Commandments on your chest as a teacher or something. Well, I guess that isn't arguably all that bad, but just kind of shoving it in people's faces, being proud of what you, I mean, being proud of, uh, I guess, uh, your clothing or enlarging the borders so people can see that you're oh, following God. I'm enlarging my, my garments. I not only have the right garments as God's required, but I'm making them bigger, and I'm showing you my phylacteries, and they're just making it very visible. And so we ought to sincerely dress for God. What is it, what is it for the New Testament Christian? Well, for women, God talks about modesty. Like men are also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. So God does talk about our physical clothing. It's not necessarily wrong to have right clothing. It, it is right to have right clothing. Uh, so he's not necessarily saying that, but just to be seen of men. All their works they do for, to, for to be seen of men. And the next thing is mentioned is their clothing. So we don't uh, necessarily wear what we wear to be seen of men. We want to kind of fit in, in a sense... Uh, look like an average man. We don't want to look like we're wearing tons of money. We don't want to bra draw attention to ourselves that we're wearing rags. But just that happy medium that I'm modest, that I'm not bringing attention to oneself. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, where, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all the glory of God. I dress for the glory of God. I do it for God's glory, not to be seen of men in verse 5. Look at verse 6. We had to sincerely dress for God. And then in verse 6, it uh, talks about uh, you know, how we should follow God. If you look at uh, verse 6, it says, And love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats at the synagogues, and greetings in the markets to be called, uh, to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye, uh, ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. See, we follow God. See, they were so concerned of their other Pharisee friends and their other religious friends that they wanted to hear them say certain titles. They wanted to hear uh, doctor, doctor, rabbi, rabbi, teacher, teacher. They wanted that title and position. And when we serve God, it's not about a title and position. It's not about the limelight. It's, it's often, often, most of our Christian life is what's not seen. And, uh, you know, you see a lot on Sundays, but that's not what my Christian life is about. If you think that Dave Will is only Dave Will on Sunday and that's what you see me as, that's, that's just a part of my life. That's just one small part, the public image. We ought to be unhypocritical and following God, not just in the public eye, but in private as well. I ought to have that private life that supports my public life and vice versa. So we sincerely follow God. See, they wanted to be heard of men and seen of men and respected of men. But he said, why call each other master and rabbi? There's only one master. There's only one Lord. And it's Jesus Christ, even Christ. And all your brethren, your brothers, and you're putting positions among each other. Look at verse 10. We ought to sincerely be humble. Look at verse 10. Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. God said, I'm not looking for the most prideful guy. That was the sin of Satan. I'm not looking for uh, one that will just be a master of everybody, but a servant of all. We, we support biblical servant leadership. I'm the most humble person in the world, and I wrote a book about it. Yeah, right. Uh, you, you just said you weren't humble if you, if you, if you had that position. I, I wrote a book on humility because I'm, I'm, I know all that there is about the humility. I got the corner on the knowledge of humility. No, you're just now pushing your knowledge forward. You become prideful. James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. I need grace. Good I don't deserve. I need tons of it, Zach. I need, I need, I need God's grace. God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We ought to be humble. Don't think you're um, better than you are. Just think, of, think about what God thinks about you. You're a sinner saved by grace. As such were some of you. So we ought to be genuine toward Christian works. Number two, we ought to be genuine towards Christian salvation. Look at verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves... Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Not only are they not saved, and they've not entered in the kingdom of, uh, of heaven, they, they've not accepted Jesus 
uh, and, and the Messiah to come. They even often rejected literally the Messiah that was before their eyes. But they even stopped people from going in believing in the Messiah. They, they kept people away. How many hundreds, if maybe even thousands, did they keep from accepting the Messiah during his lifetime? How many times did maybe the Pharisees bring people with them? We know that often if there's a leader, a religious person, will then bring people under that. No doubt that was happening. And Jesus said it was happening. That he, they're, they're shutting the gate uh, or the, uh, uh, shutting people from entering in and, and being saved, arguably. So verse, uh, verse 13 shows us we ought to be genuine and real when it comes to Christian salvation. Be real and authentic. The Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon. One day she put him to the test. She brought artificial flowers to perfectly, it's a make-believe story, but it's a good, good truth, okay? So, so, so to speak, and he brought artificial flowers, so perfectly formed. No human eye could detect them from the real flowers. She put them in a vase on Solomon's table in, the th on, in his throne room next to his flowers. She, and as he came in, the Queen of Sheba is reported to have said, Solomon, you are the wisest man in the world. Tell me without touching these flowers which are the real and which are artificial. It is said that Solomon studied the flowers for a long time and spoke nothing until finally he said, open the windows and let the bees come in. See, there's a ways to tell the artificial from the real. Let the bees come in and they will know where the real is. If we live with the authentic Jesus long enough, we will recognize the artificial when we see it. Let's, let's know when there's artificial and when we are being artificial. Let's be real. Let's be genuine and let's bring people to the Savior and not keep them from the Savior. Number one, we ought to soul win not soul destroy. Look at verse 13 again. The whole idea here that we see is they're not saved to begin with, and they're even stopping people from going in. If I'm in the flesh, I'm not positioned properly spiritually to allow people to be saved. I'm in, in, inadvertently pushing people away from that. Now, by, by accident, sometimes I can, make, I can get around that, but uh, God uses a crooked stick maybe to, 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 to make a straight line. But we ought to soul win, not soul destroy. We ought not to keep people from getting saved because of our behavior, our flesh, our attitude in that moment. Or, uh, oh, man, I thought you said you were a Christian. I can't believe you just said that, did that, thought that, acted this way, did this action. How many times has that been said to us? At all, maybe. But either way, we ought to soul win, not soul destroy. Verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, a prayer, Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. We ought to love God, not money. Now, if you weren't careful to study this and look into it, uh, what would happen here is that uh, they were devour widow houses by going in and offering prayers or offering assistance for rich widows uh, most, uh, most often. It could have been any widow for their property. And even as they were nearing older age, they would even try to weasel in and have, have their, uh, their houses uh, benefited to the synagogue or to their Pharisaic sect. And then it would just be donated after their death, or that they would be the surviving uh, male. And, and often they would mani manipulate the whole situation, then pray, uh, you know, pray for the widow. And all of it was done very hypocritically, very money motivated. And if you were to look into what it's speaking about, it was happening uh, among Phariseeism, that they would uh, kind of trick people into getting that money uh, for the synagogue. Which, are, which is astounding because it still happens today uh, among other false religions. This, this happens. These older ladies think it's the truth, and yet it's lies and false religion. They donate everything they have uh, to a false religion that can't save anybody. But here, they love God and not money. These long prayers. The situation uh, thus described may have attained its end either by using the advantages which they possessed as the jurists and notaries of the time to press unjust claims against wealthy widows or to become their heirs. By leading devout women under the show of piety to bestow on them the, their estates and houses to minister to the maintenance of the scribe was, they taught the best use of wealth, the long prayer, refers probably to the well-known 18 prayers which formed the standards of the Pharisees' devotion. And so there was even this thing that they had. It was like 18 prayers, and they'd provide prayers for widows or something like that. I was kind of looking into the history of that. It was very interesting. But either way about it, whatever it does exactly mean, they were manipulating widows for their income, for their money, is really what it is. We ought to love God, not money. It's all about God, not money. Number, th number uh, three, lead someone to Christ, not to hell. Look at verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you compass sea, or you pass the sea, and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Lead someone to Christ, not to hell. 
the zeal of the earlier Pharisee in history had showed itself in a propagandaism which reminded us rather of the spread of religion of uh, Muhammad and that of, than, than that of Christ. John uh, Hyrannicus, the last of the Maccabean priest rulers, had offered the, uh, the idea that there was an alternative to death and exile and circumcision, and he would then uh, manipulate people into uh, believing in, uh, well, I guess, a, you know, a, a form of Judaism at the time. And when the governor of Rome rendered such measures impossible, they resorted to all uh, arts of persuasion and exalted when they succeeded in enrolling a heathen convert to the member of their party. But the proselytes thus made were too often a scandal, and this proverb came to be known as, as a reproach and a, and a popular idea. What he's saying here was a, was a proverb passed around, that they were, they were the child of hell. Uh, there was no real conversion for those who were most active in the work of proselytizing were, for the most part, blind leaders of the blind, as he is later going to say. Uh, the vices of the Jew were engrafted on the vices of the heathen. And you've seen this. Um, I was actually in a, uh, with a pastor one time. Uh, of a church, you know, and uh, we were out uh, soul winning, we were out knocking doors and speaking to people about Jesus, and, uh, and uh, someone came to the door, and uh, I'll, use, I'll use Ricardo as an example, so someone came to the door, and, um, and the, the guy, the pastor goes, oh, no, I actually, I started witnessing, I, I was like, hey, uh, we're from such and such Baptist church, just wanted to tell you about Jesus, what he done on the cross for you, have, have you ever, ever heard about that story or anything about that, you know, I don't know what I said, but you know, said something like that, and he said, uh, no, n n I never heard about that. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know, the Bible teaches that we're all sinners, and I kind of started going into it. I was like, can I show you that verse in the Bible? So we go to Romans 3.23, and then all of a sudden, like, the pastor just sort of goes in and cuts me off, and because I was about to go in to just sin, and, you know, I was going to get to repentance, and all, all that stuff that you would normally do, and the pastor goes in right, right away, grabs the guy by the hand. It's really crazy. He grabs the guy by the hand, and he goes, uh, you don't want to go to hell, do you? And the guy goes, no. And he goes, well, uh, then say you're a sinner. Uh, and let, well, let's pray. Uh, say you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And uh, well, say you're a sinner. And, and uh, he wouldn't say that at first. No, I mean, the guy wouldn't even either. But he's going through it. It's weird holding your hand. But uh, <laughs> then, uh, then, then he said, uh, well, well, you believe Jesus died on the cross for you, don't you? Yeah. yeah. And he said, well, say you believe Jesus died for you. I believe Jesus died for me. And, uh, and the Bible says, if you do that, you'll have a home in heaven. And like in like five seconds, he leads this guy through a, I don't know, the, whatever you call that, a fake prayer. And he said, now you're saved. And he, he goes, if you're to die right now, where would you go? The guy, I, re I remember distinctly what the guy did. He goes, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we're so eager. Now, there's a whole thing called easy prayerism. I don't want to go into that tonight. But you have that happening sometimes to where people are so eager to soul win, so eager to, to win someone, and they get some people to repeat a prayer. Prayer doesn't save. You get in there to say the phraseology that we would say, there needs to be explanation, preaching of that concept. Not just getting people to just say a quick prayer. And, I, and no doubt that person could have got saved, but I really firmly believe that person was not saved. He didn't even know what he did. And it was done rather, maybe 10 real seconds, but, you know, 5, 10 seconds. It was done so quick. And the guy just, like, ran through it because the person actually listened. The person was ready but then made him a child of hell. And then that person's truly not converted. He might get to church, and he may struggle with sin his whole life, thinking he's saved, and he may even go to hell because that person didn't do it properly. So I think this is a little bit what we're talking about, making a proselyte, an unsaved person, getting someone to believe in a system which he doesn't truly believe, and then makes him a child of hell. That person will split hell wide open because he's not truly saved. How can he lead another person to be saved? Now, God can, do, can use anybody. Uh, you know, and God could use even a heathen to do that. Uh, he's not necessarily, he doesn't really do that. He could, he has the power to do it, but we ought to, we ought to not do it that way. We, we ought to win souls and not, uh, not make ch children of hell. Hey, guys, let's stop messing with the paper. We're rusting the paper. All right, now let's look at the next verse. All right. Number three, speak the truth, not lies. Look at verse 16 and go through verse 22 with me. Verse 16 says, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever swears by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctified the gift? Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. Whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. He that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So there's a lot going on here, but basically, 
because they were not even believers anyway, uh, they would have to make their, their position stronger. So they'd say, uh, this is true, or this, such and such, and I swear by the money of the temple, or I swear by the temple itself. And really what the overwhelming principle, to not go into every little detail here, is we don't have to swear by something greater or say, I, I swear this, it, it is absolutely true. The truth is the truth. You don't have to swear by anything. Uh, just speak truth and not lies. The principle involved in our Lord's teaching goes further than its immediate application and sweeps away the arbitrary distinction of different degrees of sanctity in the several parts of the same structure. Truth is truth. You don't need to swear or promise it's the truth. The truth is just the truth. John 8, 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, John 16, 13, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. John 17, 17, Sanctify them uh, through thy truth, thy word is truth. It just simply is the truth. I don't have to tell somebody, you know, the, the Bible says all men are sinners. And that's the truth. I swear by the church I go to. We don't, we don't have to add anything to it. It's just, it's true. God said it. That's enough. You know, it's true because God said it. Speak truth, not lies. You don't need to qualify it. And by the way, often, not, uh, not all er, in every case, but often when people say such and such and such, and that's the truth, often they're lying. O often. Why do you have to say it's the truth? If the truth is the truth. You can just say this is what it is. And let, her, your yay be yay, nay, let your yay be yay, and your nay be nay. Yes and yes. Yes means yes, no means no. All right, verse 23. Be genuine toward Christian doctrine. Verse 23 again. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anis and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought to, you have to have done, and not to leave the other undone. So what we're really seeing here is the big major things of the law. Uh, now, this would be major practices of the Old Testament law, but really as we get applied to the church would be arguably the major practices of the law in the Old Testament as they're applied to the Christian life, but rather just biblical doctrine. We had to be genuine and real when it comes to doctrine, and sometimes we're so uh, concerned about a little teeny detail and wanting people to follow this one little teeny detail, and we're not even often sometimes following a major doctrine of the Bible. Uh, we have gotten accustomed to the blurred puffs of gray fog that pass for doctrine in churches and expect nothing better. From some previously impeachable sources are now coming vague statements consisting of milky admixture of scripture. Science and human sentiment that is true to none of its ingredients because each one works to cancel the others out. Little by little, Christians these days are being brainwashed. One evidence is the increasing numbers of them are become ashamed to be found unequivocally on the side of truth. They say they believe, but their beliefs have not have been so diluted as it is impossible to, of clear definition. Moral power has always accompanied definite beliefs. Now, this is a great sentence right here. Great saints have always been dogmatic. Great saints of the past, believers in the past that have stood for God and proved it by their lifetime till the day they died, have always been dogmatic when it comes to truth, the truth of the Bible. We need a return to gentle dogmatism that smiles while it stands stubborn and firm on the word of God, and that lives and abides forever. If there's one thing you ought to be firm on and stubborn on and never move on and not get off the solid rock, it's Christian doctrine, teachings of the Bible. We don't move from that. We don't move from that. And they admitted all these weightier matters of the law, major doctrines and teachings of God's law and of God's ways, and they left it out. So we ought to be genuine and real when it comes to Christian doctrine. And number four, be genuine toward Christian living. And this will then take us to the, the end of the chapter. But we then have this whole section about just really Christian living, Christian character, the Christian life. And if you look at verse 24, it says, You blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Think of that uh, imagery in your mind. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Arguably, they're unsaved, but they make sure the outside is crystal clean. You know, I can sometimes appreciate a new believer that's not crystal clean and everything is in order on the outside uh, if their inside is becoming cleaner and cleaner. You know, because if I get that inside clean, over time, that outside cleans itself up. I think uh, a striking example, I'm glad she's not here, is, uh, is Catherine. 
I've, I've made sure the inside's clean. And have you noticed, I've never even said anything about her clothing. I've never said anything about her. I've never even approached her about church attendance. And we know in the beginning she was off and on. And, and you know, and we know that we've seen, some, some of us have been here a while. You know, we've seen the changes. And that's a testament of what happens if the inside's taken care of, the outside takes care of itself. Now, as you guide someone, you're going to have to say a few things here and there. Maybe teach them that you shouldn't wear hats or hoodies in church. And the Bible teaches that. But, you know, the, the main concern is the inside. And making sure, you know, you're not wearing a hat to God's word and covering God's word inside. Because, hey, we can maybe have a hat on or off, but if I'm not on for God, if I'm not turned uh, toward God and following after him and covering him up in my heart and putting a hat on my heart and saying, well, God, you can have part of my, my head, of my heart, you can have part of my life, but not all of it, you know, that we've missed the point. You can have a hat off in church, but I ought to be completely open with God from the inside and you know what? God's then again going to show me that truth. And for many new believers, they don't even know that verse yet. So we've got, we got to understand that. You know, strong steel or painted rust. I've actually given this illustration again. I wasn't even tempted not to give it again, but I was so impacted by this illustration. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to say it again. Maybe mo many of you forgot it. But uh, the Queen Mary was the largest ship to cross the oceans when it was launched in 1936. Uh, through four decades uh, and a world war, she served until she was retired as a floating hotel in a museum in Long Beach, California. During the conversion into a hotel, her three massive smokestacks were taken off to be scraped down and repainted. But on the dock, they crumbled. Nothing was left of the three-fourths-inch four, uh, three steel plate from which the stacks had been formed. All that remained were more than 30 coats of paint that had been applied over the years. The steel had rusted completely away. Again, are we genuine Christians? Are we living the Christian life as we should? Are we just taking care of the outside? As a Christian, I ought to care about the inside, what I think about, what I uh, am entertained with and, and gets into my thinking, how I'm reading my Bible and letting God speak to me, how I'm silently praying to him, how I worship God, how I truly love God in my heart. I have a true desire to follow him. Not that I'm a, it's a forced desire. Now, often as, as a mature believer, I may force it at times. But in a general sense, I have a desire for God. I'm desiring to follow him and be devoted to him and be, uh, be close to him and, and drawing close to him. Lord, are you just, just kind of coats of paint? Oh, there's a, there's a messed up area. Let me just paint it again. May God show us that we're not steel like we think we are. That we're just coats of paint. You can fool God. Yeah, I mean, you can't fool God. I totally messed it up. You can't fool God. You can fool the hapless public. You can be a subtle fraud. You can hide your little meanness, but you can't fool God. You can advertise your virtues. You can, uh, can self-achievement laud. You can load yourself with riches, but you can't fool God. You can criticize the Bible. You can be a selfish clod. You can lie, swear, drink, and gamble, but you can't fool God. You can magnify your talent. You can hear the world applaud. You can boast yourself somebody, but you can't fool God. God knows exactly who you are. God knows exactly what you think. God knows exactly what your character truly is, not what you make people think is your character. God knows exactly your work ethic, how you think, what your, where your hearts turn, how you deal with sin in your life, what you do at church and out of church, what you do in, in the public eye, what you do when no one's looking, what you do when the spouses are around, all that. God knows exactly who you are. To close out, let's read the rest of the chapter. Uh, beginning at that same verse again, verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but uh, within there you are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, clean first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto witted sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets, whereof, wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Whoa. Uh, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send you 
uh, prof uh, I, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. They that upon you may come all the righteous blood uh, uh, shed upon the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel and the blood of Zacharias son of uh, Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, now we see the heart of God here. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. One of the most beautiful, tender pictures that God could have ever used. And he just, he just ripped them upside and down. Uh, he just used very harsh language. But then he says, you know, but I love you guys. I would have gathered you. I want to forgive you of all that sin. I want to make you right with God. I want to be the, your Messiah. I would gather you, but you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you sh shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. An amazing uh, end of the chapter. But what's our Christian life like? We, we got it all faked. We got it all kind of set up as an outside that people can see and Yet, you know, when no one's around, we're a completely different person. We think differently, talk differently, act differently. Let's not be hypocrites. That's what re a lost religious Pharisees were like. That's what uh, scribes were like. That's, that, and that's what we had, very harsh language at. And by the way, if you are like that, this whole chapter is for you. This is your chapter. God, Jesus Christ thinks this about you if you're a hypocrite. How many times did he say, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, you actors, you actors, you actors. That's what hypocrite means, a play actor, one that knows his part, one that can act. You actors, boy, you're acting very good. You're acting, you're faking it really good. You're fake, you're fake, you're fake. Is he saying that about, is he saying that about you tonight? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, would you help us to not be fake Christians? And help us to not be uh, hypocritical Christians. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be genuine, real Christians that have a real relationship with you, Lord. If you whisper something to our ear, may we be so quick to listen to it. Are we ready to hear you, Lord? Or do we have the world so turned up that we can't hear you? Lord, do we have uh, all the entertainment of the world so focused on our vision and mindset and heart that we, don't even, we can't even hear your still, small voice? Lord, help us to not be hypocritical. I pray, Lord, you'd help us tonight. And, I, and I, I pray this, Lord, that you would help us to make, take care of business tonight. I don't want to ask for a raise of hands. Everyone would be too embarrassed to raise their hand. But, Lord, may we, know, we, may we do what it takes to go back tonight. And if you spoke to us on any area of our life, would we, would we be quick to take care of that and get it right with you? Lord, we thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.